Today on the Perception in Action News. Can soccer players and referees be tricked into seeing something that didn't actually happen? How well can an athlete detect where an opponent is headed based on sound alone? Is training in front of a mirror effective? Does it involve an internal or external focus of attention? So it's time for a call to action. Hi everyone, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In these news segments, my goal is to dig through that ever-growing pile of article PDFs so you don't have to. So on to the news. Dateline Cognitive Research, Principles and Implications, September 2016. Back in a German Premier League match in October 2013, Bayer Leverkusen captured a decisive win over Hoffenheim with a header into the back of the net off a corner kick. Or did they? If you're a soccer fan, you're probably aware of this infamous phantom goal. If you've not seen it, I've included a link in the show notes. In reality, the headed ball actually went through a hole in the side of the net instead of across the goal line. But on first watch, very few people saw it that way, including the referees on the field. Why? This play is an excellent example of something we call filling in in perception research. Way back in episode 3 of the podcast when I talked about eye movements, I discussed that because our area of high resolution vision, our fovea, is so small, it's virtually impossible for us to see everything that happened during an event in high detail. It's like we're moving a small flashlight around in the dark, only catching brief glimpses. What happens in this situation? Well, we fill in the gaps between what we did actually perceive. This occurs both in space and time. A good example of the former is the blind spot in our eye. If you keep your eyes completely still, there is actually an area in the visual scene that you will be completely blind to. This is because the part of your retina that receives light from that area does not have any photoreceptors. Instead, it is where the optic nerve leaves your eye to head off and carry visual information to your brain. But we don't actually notice this because we fill it in. That is, we use visual information from the surrounding areas to basically guess what is in our blind spot. For temporal filling in, we often infer a causal link between two events we perceived, even though there might not actually have been one. In the phantom goal example, it's likely many people there that day saw the ball being headed and the ball in the back of the net. They might have missed perceiving what happened in between because their vision was blocked by other players or they could not move their eyes fast enough to follow the headed ball. So they did the logical thing. They filled in the gap in the event with something that was very likely to have occurred. If a player strikes a ball, then it appears in the back of the net, it seems completely reasonable to assume the ball must have crossed the goal line in between these two things. The tricky thing about this filling in process is that it's very fast and largely unconscious, so that most people are unaware it happened and instead swear they actually perceived the event that happened in between. In an interesting recent study, Brockhoff examined whether the likelihood of this causal filling in happening depends on the perceptual motor experience with the event being observed. If you recall, the ability to anticipate events on the field, for example detecting a deceptive move by a player, does seem to depend on this experience. With individuals that watch play regularly, such as judges and referees, having an advantage over people that do not watch the sport, and individuals that have both perceptual and motor experience, that is players, doing the best out of all groups. In this current study, 42 soccer novices, 16 players in the German Football League, and 18 FIFA referees were asked to watch video sequences of soccer play. These included corner kicks, free kicks, kickoffs, and throw-ins. Scenes in which a player making contact with the ball was part of the sequence were compared with ones for which the contact point was edited out. Participants were asked to indicate whether or not they saw the contact or not. The main findings were that participants were highly susceptible to the filling-in illusion as they indicated seeing contact in a high proportion of trials for which there was not, and there was no significant difference in this effect for novices, players, and referees. 
The fact that we have this strong tendency to fill in things we missed based on perceived causality has important implications for our ability to see things on the field accurately. For example, if we see a defender approach a player with a ball, then the next thing we see is the offensive player lying on the ground hurt, we are very likely to believe that we also saw contact between the two players, even when it might not have occurred. And furthermore, this study by Brockhoff and colleagues suggests that this is not an effect that can be reduced through experience with the sport. Sometimes our perceptual system is just too efficient for our own good. Dateline, Journal of Experimental Psychology, Human Perception and Performance, November 2016. On this podcast, I've predominantly talked about visual perception, as it is the most well-studied and clearly the most important sense we use to control our movements. However, that does not mean that we don't get contributions from our other senses. Back in episode 18, I talked about some research I've done looking at how baseball batters can use information from the sense of touch and audition to know where the ball is headed after they hit it, even before they actually see it go there. If you think about it, there are likely to be several other situations in sport where non-visual perceptual information can help an athlete. One such situation is... That of course was the sound of a basketball player dribbling the ball up the court. There is a lot going on there in terms of auditory information. Can basketball players actually use this information to determine where a player they are guarding is headed with the ball? This could potentially be a very useful skill because it will allow a defender to take their eyes off the player they are guarding temporarily to look at other players. For example, to see whether someone is coming beside them to set up a screen. This exact situation was recently studied by Campo Nogara and colleagues. Specifically, Audio recordings were taken from a professional basketball player dribbling around an opponent, either to the left or the right. There are two basic conditions, non-deceptive movements and deceptive ones, in which the player tried to fake out the defender. After making the recordings, the authors first analyzed them to determine what perceptual information was available to the listener. Bravo! This is an excellent approach to doing perception action research. The first step in any experiment should always be in understanding the stimulus you're going to present to the participants. Two main acoustic variables were examined. Interaural intensity differences, which is the difference in the loudness of sounds between your left and right ear, and interaural time differences, which is the difference in the time of arrival of sounds to your left and right ear. If you think about it, these two information sources are strongly related to the direction a sound is coming from and where it is headed. For example, if something begins moving on the left side of the court, it will produce a sound that is slightly louder and arrives slightly earlier to our left ear because it is closer to that ear than it is to the right. And remember, unlike light, sound travels fairly slowly, so you do get a detectable difference in time. Analysis of recordings of the non-deceptive moves reveal that these two interaural differences are highly informative as there is a noticeable change in them at the exact instant the attacker with the ball begins to go around the defender. Not surprisingly, they're not as informative for deceptive moves, and if anything, they indicate the completely wrong direction. After this analysis, the recordings were used in two separate experiments, one in which the seated participants had to move a slider to indicate the direction the player with the ball was headed, and one in which they stood on a court and had to step in that direction. For both, the performance of basketball players was compared to non-players. What was found? For the slider task, there was no significant difference between the basketball and non-basketball groups in terms of response accuracy. For the non-deceptive movements, both groups made errors on roughly 3% of the trials, while for deceptive movements, error rates were 44% for players and 55% for non-players, a difference that wasn't significant. The players did make the responses significantly faster than non-players in this experiment. For the full body stepping task, there was a much bigger group difference. For the deceptive movements, basketball players had an error rate of 37%, while non-players rate was 67%. 
a difference that was statistically significant. There was again also significant differences in the time required to initiate the movement response, with players moving more quickly. This difference between the slider and full body stepping tasks is not surprising. One of the points I've tried to make continually on the podcast is that when you make the experimental task closer to the real sport, that is more ecologically valid, you get bigger expertise differences. But in a nutshell, I think this study nicely shows that there is acoustic information available for detecting movements of a dribbler in basketball, even deceptive ones, and that we become attuned to these information sources by playing the game. Dateline, plus one, November 2016. Okay, before I tell you what this paper is about, I have to come clean here. As I think I mentioned before on the podcast, I serve as an associate editor for the Journal of Experimental Psychology, Human Perception, and Performance. Therefore, with the help of reviewers, I have to make a lot of reject-accept decisions about papers for the journal. And the one I'm about to talk about is actually one I had to reject. It was not because it was not an interesting or important topic or flawed in any way. If this were true, I wouldn't be wasting your time with it on the podcast. Rather, its focus is a bit too applied for JEPHPP, where we put a really heavy emphasis on theory. So I'm really glad to see the authors took their work to another journal and got it published, because it's a really interesting paper. The study I'm talking about was conducted by Israel Halperin and colleagues from the Australian Institute of Sport. They were interested in looking at the effectiveness of a very commonly used practice in sport and exercise, training in front of a mirror. For example, when lifting weights. This is an interesting situation because it raises an important question. What type of focus of attention is involved when you look at yourself in a mirror, internal or external? As I discussed way back in episode 9 of the podcast and several times since, One of the most consistent findings we have seen in sports science over the last 20 years or so is the difference in performance that arises when a person attends to their own body movement, internally, or the effect of their own movement on some other object, externally. While we can quibble over the exact details, in general, adopting an external focus of attention is better once a performer achieves any kind of mastery of a skill at all. In their study, Halperin and colleagues asked participants to perform either a bicep curl or a counter movement jump, which is kind of like a dynamic squat, under four different focus of attention conditions. Looking at themselves in the mirror, an internal instruction to focus on the muscles being used, an external instruction to focus on the straps around the weights or pushing off on the floor, and a neutral condition in which they could attend to whatever they wished. The goal for both tasks was to produce as much force as possible. What was found? Consistent with previous research, for the bicep curl, force production was significantly greater in the external focus of attention condition as compared to all others. Looking in the mirror and neutral were tied for second, while the internal focus of attention condition produced the worst performance. For the multi-joint counter-jump task, there was no statistically significant differences between the conditions, although the trend was the same as for the bicep curls. On an applied level, these findings are important because they suggest that the very common practice of looking at yourself in the mirror may not be the most effective way to exercise. Better performance is produced when we use an external focus of attention. On a theoretical level, these findings suggest that there's something different between focusing on your body directly and focusing on it using a mirror, which I think is fascinating. I look forward to more research to understand exactly why this difference occurs. Well, that's it for the news. Coming soon on the Perception in Action podcast, how does self-talk and the use of mantras influence performance? If you're interested in more articles like the ones I talked about today, give me a follow on Twitter, at ShakyWaits. And remember, you can find out everything you ever wanted to know about this podcast at PerceptionAction.com. This is your intrepid reporter, Rob Gray from ASU, and I am out of here.